Ah, uh, yes. Hey, now you can hear me. I always forget to do that. I always forget to push the button. Okay, so let's try that one more time. I am Griff Hamlin from Blues Guitar Unleashed. Welcome and thanks for joining me today. In today's episode, we are going to do a little Ask Griff. I have printed out some questions. <laughs> printed out questions. Um, so, for those of you that are uh, Blues Guitar Unleashed members, and uh, if you're not, you might want to try out the All Access Pass. Always a, always a good choice. Um, we have, uh, of course, there's other options. If you just kind of want to get a feel, see what it's all about, maybe download the free uh, ebook, check that out, uh, kind of give you a feel for, <clears throat> excuse me, my style and how things go. What we do, if you uh, did not get a notification, if you didn't get my email, you want to get my emails, there's the link, uh, gobgu.com slash the list. I do a lot of stuff via email. I'm old. I like email. I'm not so good on the social media. <laughs> so I'm learning. I guess I'm getting a little bit better at it. But nonetheless, I'm still kind of old school. I, I likes me the email. That works good for me. But anyhow, um, so I've got some questions. And these came from uh, the BGU member forum. Uh, some, uh, a couple of guys posted some, some questions earlier on Facebook. Uh, unfortunately, I don't know how to do this sort of thing on YouTube. So for you folks that are on YouTube watching me right now, if, uh, if you have a question, post it up. Um, they scroll by pretty quick, but I'm going to try and, and take some time here and answer to the best of my ability. Um, I, uh, I always encourage uh, drinking, especially on, on Fridays, so I have my little ice here and my Gentleman Jack. So I encourage, if you're, uh, if you're so inclined, knock yourself out. And let's get right to it. Okay, so uh, let, me get through my, uh, let me get through my written questions first. And then I'll jump into live questions. All righty. It looks like we've got plenty of folks. Everybody can hear me okay. Should be working. Yeah, I know. But you know what? It's close to 5 o'clock, right? And it's uh, it's Friday. And uh, yeah. Okay. Cool. All right. And I'll get to, like I said, I'll get to the live questions here a little bit later. <clears throat> so the first question I had was about a jazz blues. Okay. And uh, the question was basically, you know, how do jazz guys modify a blues to turn it into, you know, a jazz blues. And there's a couple of different, a uh, couple of different cool things that can happen. So the, if you look at, um, you know, sort of the traditional blues, right? Let's say we had traditional, I'm going to turn off the overdrive here and let's just play like that. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, let's say we're playing a blues in G. And we have four bars of, of G7 up front. And then we have a four chord. And a one chord. And then we do five and four and one and five. One of the most common things that jazz players will do is instead of five and four, they'll do two and five. So in the key of G, instead of the five chord, we'll play an A minor seven. And instead of the four chord, we'll play the five chord. Okay, so you get something like. Right, and then the four chord. And back to the one chord. And the two and five. And the other part is the turnaround. So instead of basically a bar of one and a bar of five, we'll do two beats each. Two beats of G7, two beats of the six, E minor seven or E minor, but it often gets turned into a dominant seventh type. My personal favorite is E7 sharp nine. And then the two, the A minor seven, and the five, the D seven. So we have one, six, two, five. Okay. So if I put that all together, again, you know, my G seven, one, three, four, one, three, four, one, two, three, four, two, two, and the four, and the one, and then we have the two. And five and one, six, two, five. And the four. You 
can sometimes add the sharp four diminished seven. That's kind of a cool move that a lot of jazz players will do. So they'll go from the four up a half step uh, to a diminished seven chord, back to the one and the two and the five and then the big turnaround. and then a two, and then a five. That's another thing that sometimes happens. So we have one, and then the four, then the sharp four diminished, then the one, and then the six, and then the two, and then the five, and then one, and six, and two, and five, and one. And those are kind of, you know, you could have any or all, <laughs> right? You know, as with any blues. Uh, and sometimes you have a quick change and sometimes you don't, uh, you know, which is, which is the second bar of the form. If the second bar of the form is a four chord, we call it a quick change. That's just the way, that's just what we do. And again, you can have any or all of those. They're all fair game or none of them. You can have, you know, there are some jazz blues tunes that are pretty straight. And there are some that have, you know, even more stuff than that. They use a, a technique called back cycling to, to use two fives to two fives to two fives. And it gets really complicated and it's, it sort of gets to the point where it's hard to recognize as a blues anymore. So, you know, there comes a point where you sort of got to look at it and go, man, eh, I'm not sure if it's a blues anymore. But nonetheless, um, those are some, those are some really common, uh, you know, types of variations that jazz players will do. If you have blues, the Blues Guitar Unleashed course, Lesson 12 has a jazz blues in it. We talk about all those different things, including back cycling and all that kind of stuff. Uh, it's also covered in Acoustic Blues Guitar Unleashed, um, kind of in a, in a jazz blues with a walking bass. You can, you can kind of have some, some fun with that where you so, sort of... Um, Maybe put the Stormy Monday change. There's the two, five. Nah, I made up something there that didn't work out. get carried away. You can have a lot of fun with that. Um, and uh, and I do, I, I have some lessons uh, floating around uh, with that kind of stuff. I know it's in a couple of different courses that I've done over the years, so it's definitely out there. But um, but that's, that's uh, basically what jazz blues is all about. So uh, that's a good one. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, Tommy asked, um, so he's got an upcoming gig with two 45-minute sets. And this is, so this is more of a, you know, I'll say a gigging band question. Uh, he said, one, do you start out with your, he's trying to come up with set lists for two 45 minute sets, which is pretty, pretty solid, uh, pretty solid amount of time. He said, do you start out with your best stuff first or do you kind of build for the second set? And uh, he said, what is the ratio of slow blues songs to medium or up tempo songs, that kind of thing. And when your band is putting together a set list, how does the discussion go? Well, uh, Tommy, you know my wife, so and she plays in my band. So the discussion goes, I come up with a set list, and she says, no, this one's better, and she fixes it. So, <laughs> and if Laura's on, she'll absolutely back me up on that one. <laughs> I, I come up with a set list, and she fixes it. Um, which, is, which is, you know, she's amazing at, at set lists, so I let her. Uh, but I don't... Um, you really have to, this is, this is one of those kind of odd situations. You kind of have to think about what your crowd is going to be. A two 45 minute set gigs can go uh, a couple of different ways. It could be 
that the first set, there isn't going to be that many people there. And then by the, by, you know, maybe you have like a little half hour break or 15 minute break and most people will tend to arrive for the second set. If you believe that's going to be the case, then yeah, I would want to save some of my best material till when people get there a little bit later on. On the other hand, if you're pretty sure that the crowd's going to be fairly consistent in size for both sets, I wouldn't wait. I would sprinkle some of my best material in both sets. Uh, and when I say best, I mean most popular in your experience. Okay. Obviously, it might not, it may or may not be something that you feel that you pr play very well, but you got to sort of think about your audience and what is typically received well. That's what I mean by a best song. We have certain songs that we play that people really seem to enjoy. When I play Pride and Joy, obviously that's a very recognizable song. People really love it. So I'm generally not going to play that as the first song in the first set when there's nobody there. That's kind of a waste, right? So. As far as um, how I, I sort of weave in slow versus mid-tempo or whatever, particularly if there's a dance floor and you expect people to get up and dance and have a good time, I try to have the first three tunes of each set be pretty upbeat stuff that people can dance to. At which point I will do something slow to let people take a little break. If you kind of think about you know how you would want to see a show at a club, you might think the same thing. Yeah, I kind of like having a chance to go to the bar, or sit down and rest for a minute. Um, and then after that slow one, I might do kind of a medium, te medium tempo one to ease back into two or three more up-tempo songs. And then whether or not you're gonna have time to do more or less just depends on how long you know your songs are, how many solos you guys take. I've had sets where I've done six songs in 45 minutes and I've had times when I've done 12. So uh, that's that's going to depend a lot on, on you and your band. Okay, so uh, hope that answers your question. I think that's everything you asked me and hopefully uh, hopefully that's, that's cool. Um, all right, so continuing on. <laughs> uh, my wife, yes, that a boy, fourth tune is slow. Good job, proud wife. Thank you, honey. She's what she see she's watching me to make sure that I don't tell tell Tommy to do it wrong. Uh, okay, so, uh, so uh, another question. Uh, this was kind of about ear training. He said, "How how important is it to be able to recognize the same note in different octaves? My ear finds it extremely difficult to pick up notes in a different octave when listening to music." And admittedly, I'm not sure if I understand your question, so I'm going to answer it a little bit in a roundabout way. There's definitely an advantage to being able to hear intervals, um, such as an octave or a fifth. Um, and, and you went on to ask about, you know, perfect fourth, fifth, third, all that kind of stuff. Yes, there is an advantage to being able to hear that, but whether or not it is worth the time commitment to learn that skill, is really hard to say because it, it, it is a skill, it can be learned, you know, college students the world over do it day in and day out, uh, you know, music school kids do it. You know, I went through a couple years of, of, of ear training, my wife went through it, you know, um, in college, we all, we all do that where we have to, by ear, recognize the interval of a fourth or a fifth or an octave. Um, I think it's the kind of thing where if you have a little extra time and you want to practice hearing that kind of thing, it, it might serve you down the road, but I'll be the first to admit it's something that I rarely use. I actually use it more singing than playing guitar. Um, when I sing, I often have to sing harmony, and so I have to be able to hear what would a third above that note be. I have to hear that in my mind so I can sing it, or what would a, what would a third below that note be so I can sing it. So it's much more useful to me as a skill vocally than it is with my guitar. I almost never use it on guitar. Um, and, and speaking of singing, he said, when someone talks about singing in a certain key to match their vocal range, I get very confused. Okay, so let's say that I'm, that I'm playing, you know, I don't know, Pride and Joy, right? And let's say that I'm playing it in E. And, you know, okay, well, let's say that that's a really hard note for you to hit. Um, you might have to, maybe that, maybe that note's too high, okay? 
And if you bring it down an entire octave, well, you heard about the love given sight to the blind. That kind of, when it starts to, I'll say, get in the basement, you know, vocally, it starts to feel lower like that. Sometimes it doesn't carry over the band very well. If you feel the resonance more in your chest, sometimes it just doesn't, it just doesn't carry out so well. So you might decide that it would be easier since, since that note's too high, maybe you bring it down to D. Right? And maybe that is more comfortable for you or for your singer. Okay, um, the Stevie Ray Vaughan recording of that song is in E flat, so there's kind of splitting the difference between E and D. He did that by tuning the guitar down a half step and playing in E, but it serves the same purpose. Uh, some people, you know, Mike asks, what key you do? Do you do Pride Joy? I know you're on here. What key you do it in? Um, on, I think you're on the Facebook right now, but, uh, but yeah, if you, um, Mike, do you do it in C? <laughs> Right, maybe that's more comfortable. You just kind of have to try them out. There's uh, an interesting question that often comes up too: is like, how do I know what my key is? It, it, and it's it's never the same for any two songs. It depends how the melody of the song goes against the chords. There are songs that are in the key of E that I have no trouble singing at all, and there are other songs in the key of E that are really, really a struggle. So it just sort of depends. Sometimes I take things down to D or C sharp. Sometimes I take them up. You know, sometimes they they feel low, so it it just depends. And there's no uh, there's no perfect key. It's there's no like nobody could say, oh, D is my key. I sing everything in D. That's that's not gonna that's not gonna happen. That that doesn't really make sense. Okay, uh, let's see here. And please explain Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do as a movable scale. Now, I'll be the first, the Do system, I'll be the first to admit I was lousy at in college. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do is, is called solfege, and it's, it's a way of naming notes when you sing them with your voice. And so voice students often use Do, Re, Mi, Fa, it's the notes of the major scale. Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do. And there are different schools of thought on that. So there's what's called movable do, where if you move it to the key of A, A now becomes do, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do. And then there's also the school of thought, there's what's called fixed do. So therefore, do is C, and that's it. End of story. So if I was to play in A, it would be do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, la, ti. And then that wouldn't be do, it's like D, it's some, it's some other thing because it's C sharp and I don't know how it works and I don't care because I'm never going to have to use it again in my life. So uh, that's, that's kind of where Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol, La, Ti, Do comes from. It's, it's solfege. I can't fathom any reason you might ever actually use it. So I wouldn't worry about it. I would never give it another thought in your life. <laughs> and there you have it. Okay, so uh, if you had to pick one thing, this was uh, this was a Facebook question earlier. Um, if you had to pick one thing to focus on to improve soloing, what would it be? Assuming the person is an interme intermediate player and knows the basics, etc. Um, the, the the problem with that question is that it ignores the fact that you really have to develop three things simultaneously. Soloing requires. I, I have what I call the soloing tripod. One leg of that is approaches in theory and, and I'll say the book learning part, right? Which is, uh, you know, what scales do can we use in a blues, for example? Uh, what notes go well together? Um, what chords are involved? How do they work together harmonically? Can I, what, what scales are, are my different options at different points within a blues progression? Now, admittedly, uh, though, you know, those things, once you learn them, you don't have to relearn them. That's kind of nice. You don't necessarily have to keep them up. So a lot of times that leg of the stool can be pretty easy, right? Especially if that leg of the stool is nothing more than, okay, I'm going to play the A minor blue scale all the time over the key of A. Cool. That's, that's fine. Later on, you might want to build that up. You might want to add levels of sophistication to that leg of the stool. 
but you can get away with, I'm playing the minor blues scale all the time. And, and, and I did a video a couple of weeks ago where I talked about different approaches. And that's really what that leg of the stool is. So you may be, let's say you're in a position where you know, okay, if I'm playing a blues, I can play the minor blues scale the whole time and that's how I want to approach it. And I'm good with that. Cool. The second leg of the stool is to learn complete solos. And the reason that you learn complete solos is because they, it's sort of like, you know, I don't know if your kids did this when they were little, but my kids all going through like kindergarten and first and second and third grade, they would learn these poems and little speeches. I think we all learned the Gettysburg Address and Caesar Augustus's address and stuff. And, you know, we don't learn that stuff to learn the words. We learn that stuff because it gives us, it sort of, through osmosis, we start to learn how a speech or the reason you would learn a whole solo is you learn how a solo goes. It's it's what I call story form from start to finish, right? You you probably you know I th I would I think most of us know some blues player probably some local blues player that's got gobs of chops and all these licks and still isn't any fun to listen to. Okay, that's a guy who's worked too much on the third leg and hasn't done enough complete solos. And so he doesn't have, he does, he's not telling a story with the solo. He's just throwing out a bunch of licks. And that's cool, but it, it's, it's again, it's only one leg of the stool. And it's the third leg, which is the licks and the phrases that you need to learn. Okay, so you have leg number one is, you know, the different approaches and the theory behind it and why stuff works. Leg two is complete solos, learning them from start to finish. That, again, sort of gets you to learn that story form. You start to develop it over time. Leg number three, the cool licks, the, the Stevie Ray Vaughan licks, the Jimi Hendrix licks, the Albert King licks, the whoever you're into licks. So you can start to build that vocabulary, right? So if I had to pick the one thing for you to focus on, I would pick the leg that needs the most work of those three. Okay, so since I can't hear you, that's going to have to be up to you to, to determine. But if you are the kind of player who opens up, you know, a, a book full of 100 blues licks or, or goes and watches a video with 100 blues licks, but you've never learned a solo from start to finish, then I would tell you that that's exactly where you need to go. On the other hand, if you're a player who knows 10 or 12 different solos start to finish, but you've never broken any of those individual licks out and just tried to play them over jam tracks and make them work for you, then I would tell you that that's what you should do. So I hope that, uh, I hope that answers your question. Okay, so that's the end of my, of my built-in questions. Let me go, uh, let's see, uh, I saw a couple over here come on the YouTube, let's see. Um, can you talk about triads? You know, I, I can, but I never use triads. I'm not sh I'm, I, I don't, I don't think that way. A triad is, you know, uh, three notes of a, scale, of a scale. It's a chord, right? So that's what a triad is. I can't, in, in my world, uh, and maybe it's the way I approach music, I, I just don't see any reason to think about triads very much. Uh, it just doesn't come up. I certainly know them. I have tons of theory. I just don't use it. So I'm not really sure how that's going to be helpful. <laughs> um, I'm intermediate. Can you talk about the pentatonic with the sixth? Yeah. So the, the pentat, and I'm assuming that you're meaning the pentatonic minor. Okay. So in a, in a pentatonic minor scale, right, we have root, flat, third, fourth, fifth, flat, seventh. If you take that and you move it down a half step, you get the sixth. So root, flat, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, flat, seventh, root, flat, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, flat, seventh, root. So as it turns out, that note will work over every single chord in a blues. So it's a great note to use. And sometimes, particularly over the four chord, I like to use it instead of the flatted seventh. It's a great note to use. Now, obviously that's a, a, a long road to go down. I do have, um, 
if you are a BGU member, if you have the All Access Pass or you have the BGU Insiders, I do have a lesson about that uh, in the member area. Um, it's called the Pentatonic Six Sound. And there's a couple of solos about it and all the different patterns and all that kind of stuff. So it is in there. Um, but past explaining it in, in that regard, I don't know that I can, I don't know that I can tell you much more just on a, on a quick lesson like this, other than try it out. It's a really fun sound. It's one I use all the time. And try adding that six, just, you know, put on a, a blues jam track and just try adding that six in different places because you'll probably like the sound. It's, it really is a cool sound. Uh, how do you solo over those jazz chords? Uh, very carefully. <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't resist. Um, uh, soloing over jazz, again, it's just like blues. Uh, you, you'll hear me talk about blues in levels of sophistication. I could play the minor blues scale over that jazz blues too, and I have, okay? Um, I mean, I've, I've definitely done that. Uh, or I can increase the levels of sophistication. I can add in modes, I can add in altered sounds, I can add in more and more and more and more, but I don't have to, okay? So it, if, you're, if you're thinking about, okay, you wanna get into doing you know, more jazz or more outside sounds, look into, I have a video on the half whole diminished scale, uh, and that is probably my number one, I'll say, outside sound that I use. I sometimes use a sound called the altered dominant, which is the seventh mode of the mul of the jazz melodic minor. <laughs> okay, the, so there's a there's a couple of whacked out sounds for you to try to figure out. Um, but I would I would I would try to get comfortable with the half hole diminished first. If you're going to try to do an outside sort of more jazzier sound, um, that's that's how you that's a good one to, to start with. Uh, okay, play arpeggios of the chords to start with. Uh, yeah, you can also do that. I mean, arpeggios are great. They just don't sound very bluesy. That's probably my biggest beef with arpeggios. But I I do have some ways to to kind of blues them out. Um, those are real amps behind me. Yes, they are. Uh, let's just. Awesome, very, very cool. I'm glad that your teacher is uh, is amazed, that's great. Uh, how, how important is playing with other people to developing as a player? Okay, so for any of you who are on right now that have been to one of my live events, I think you can you can probably chime in here, but uh, but Kevin asks, you know, how important is is playing with other people to to developing uh, as a, as a player? And I think it is probably the single best thing you can do for yourself. If you are at a point where you're you can play some chords and you can and you can start to get some tunes out, playing along with other people will do more for your playing than absolutely anything else you can do, hands down, no question about it. Um, any suggestions for improving as a singer? Let's see. Oh, bending notes. Get the other string caught and sounding without wanting it to. Uh, that's actually more in your in your picking hand muting. Um, there's a uh, there's a there's a little bit of a trick to that. So you know, as I bend up, right? And so what you don't want is that where you, where your finger comes off. My right hand is what's doing that. So either the back side of my thumb hits that hits that third string or the heel of my hand. And that's how I do that. It's all in it's all in the picking hand. That's that's where or the other the other thing that happens Um, what was I going to say? Uh, sometimes, yeah, it doesn't really happen much with a bend, now that I'm thinking about it. But you'll notice that sometimes when I hit a note, I have these other three fingers here. That's another, another muting tactic that works really well. Okay, uh, let's see. Let me, uh, let me, let me switch over here to the, let me switch over to the Facebooks. I've been answering all the, the YouTube questions. Let me see what I got here. 
And this is kind of weird how this goes. So, uh, let's see. Uh, looks like so this is the three. Discuss the three places that the pentatonic boxes overlay the major scale in the relish. Oh boy, I'm not sure I can do that. Let's discuss the three places that the pentatonic boxes overlay the major scale. Yeah, see, I. I'm not sure I really look at them that way. I think you're you're almost getting into caged a little bit there. Um, I, yeah, I'm I'm not sure I understand the question well enough. In general, uh, Eric, I will say that I very rarely use diatonic scales, modes, major scales, minor scales, that kind of thing. Very very rarely when I play blues. Uh, it just, it, it always ends up sounding like a scale. There's almost no way, uh, and this goes back to a video, a, a session I did just the other day, where I talked about how you can compartmentalize the notes in different ways, right? If I take, let's say, uh, yeah, I know, I always use A. So how, let's, let's use C, right? Um, if I take a C mixolydian scale, So that's a C dominant or a C mixolydian scale. It's the fifth mode of the F major scale, if, if you want to get fancy. Okay. And let's say that I add some blue notes. The flatted third and the flatted fifth. right? Nine of them. Right? That's a lot of, that's a lot of notes. Probably too many, right? You wouldn't want to play all that. So how would I divide it up? Well, one of the ways I could divide it up is I could divide it up into the minor blues sound and the major blues sound. Okay, and, and it turns out that if I subdivide the notes in that way, I end up with the same thing, <laughs> right? Or, or maybe, uh, like, what I like to do is take the major blues sound uh, and add the flatted seventh. Okay, and so... I, I kind of go back and forth. I'll play a little bit of major, a little bit of minor, a little bit of major, a little bit of minor. Yeah, sometimes I'll play a little bit of both, but it's it's really unusual. It might be something like that. You know, it's just a just a little thing because I don't want it to get too scalar. So I hope I hope that makes sense and and maybe speaks to your question uh, a little bit there. Um, okay, let me see what else we got here. How do you use thirds when soloing? Um, I don't. <laughs> That's probably the easiest way to put it. I know where my roots are. You know, like, I, I, I do almost all the time, I know where my root is, I know where the third is, but I think in chords, I don't think in intervals. So. I, I would never think to myself, oh, I'm going to play the note a third away from this. I'm, you know, or I need a major third or I need a minor third. I might think, okay, if I'm in D and I've got a D, I'm going to play an F sharp because it's a major chord. But, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't even go through that thought process. I just would play it. But uh, I don't, I don't think, I don't think about intervals uh, all, uh, hardly ever. I like, people ask me about intervals all the time and I don't use them. I know them and I'm very good at figuring them out and you know discussing them and everything and we can talk about it all day long. And if I was composing in four parts, uh, you know, composing a chorale or something, then sure I'd probably use it, but I'm playing blues. I I, I see no I see no use for them. That's <laughs> really what it boils down to. <laughs> uh, do you have these as lessons on CDs? Um, all of all of the stuff that I that I do uh, almost everything is is available on DVD or, or and, and CD. Yes, all, if you go to the my course catalog, 
uh, bluesguitarunleashed.com slash course catalog or you know go to bluesguitarunleashed.com and hit the course catalog link at the top. All the courses there come on DVD. The digital versions are all available in the All Access Pass, of course, and then you just you just can pick and choose. And there's got to be a thousand different lessons there now. Um, but if if you are looking for something in particular, yes, you can get it on DVD. Uh, let's see, Griff. Uh, Try. Uh huh. Okay, so David's asking about the balance. Any advice about the balance or the mix between practicing something? that's, I'll say, difficult and playing something for fun. Um, you know, everybody's different. It, that's one of those things where the best thing that you can do for yourself is to, is to really realize for yourself where that point is. Where, okay, I can focus on this thing that's hard for about 20 minutes, but then, you know, I start to get fried and I gotta do something fun. If you know that, then stick to it. That's more important than me saying, well, you should spend 50% of your time doing that and 50% of your time doing that, because it's not going to be the same for everybody. Um, and like I used to love practicing scales, and that's weird. Very few people like practicing scales. For me, it was sort of always that competition with the metronome, and I had fun with it. But for a lot of people, practicing scales is super miserable. So while I could do it for an hour, no problem, the next guy might only be able to do it for 10 minutes before he's pulling his hair out. So what's more important, really, like I say, is that you kind of get a good sense for yourself of what that balance is between, okay, I'm fried and I want to go, I want to go jam. I want to go play and have some fun. The other thing is that it may vary from day to day. So you might be playing today, you might know that in general you can play for about 20 minutes on something hard, and then you gotta take a break and go do something else or stand up and walk around, whatever. And then one day you might sit down and after five minutes you're super frustrated with it. Then, then for God's sake, stop, <laughs> right? It's, you know, this is not work, it's playing guitar. It's not working guitar. So if you're not having any fun with it and it's frustrating you today, then set it aside. Come back later. You know, it's, it's amazing, you know, take a nap and come back or go play something else for a while and come back. My, my old classical guitar teacher used to just literally walk around his house with the guitar around his neck when he didn't feel like practicing. And he'd go make a sandwich or do whatever, but inevitably at some point he'd find himself picking up the guitar because it was just there. So just keep it there. Go on with your day, do something else, but keep the guitar handy and you, you'll be on it soon enough. Uh, let's see. Wow, I got there's a lot of comments, guys. I'm I'm doing my best. Uh, what are the amps behind you, and are they tube amps? Uh, yeah, uh, Marshall 100 watt Plexi reissue. This is a, an old Nace. Um, these these three Naces are all old Nace prototypes. Actually, um, Art Nace is a very dear friend of mine, and I had a hand in in voicing that amp substantially. Uh, that cap, it's a you know Mesa 412 cabinet. Um, that is a Port City 212 cabinet. That is an empty cabinet. That one is an Egnator 412, and that is a reissue Fender Deluxe Reverb. They are all real amps. They do all work. They're not currently plugged in at the moment, um, but they do work. This is this is kind of storage behind me. In the next room, I have. Uh, several more amps, um, and depending on what I'm doing in the studio right now, depends on which amps I have handy. So that's why sometimes you see those change out. Let's see. Is playing with beginners when you are intermediate or advanced helpful? You know, I think it is. I think playing with beginners, if you're an intermediate or advanced player, I, I have two schools of thought on that. One is, I always think it's best to try to be the worst person in the band. I do think that that will inspire you and, and encourage you to, to step up and, and do better. So I think it's great to put yourself in that position. However, I also think that it's great to put yourself in a position of sort of a teacher role sometimes. Um, if you're patient enough to do it, you will learn an enormous amount teaching others how to do certain things. So if you're playing in a group where there's maybe people that aren't as experienced as you are and you can show them, you know, that chord's probably not going to work right there. Let's try this voicing. It might be easier for you. Or this is going to sound better based on what I'm playing. 
those kinds of things will make you a, a more well-rounded musician. Uh, in answer to your question about my guitar, this is a 335. It's four or five years old. It's, uh, it's nothing like, it's not vintage or anything. I don't have any, I guess some of my guitars might be getting to be vintage. I think my, I think my Sunburst Sir is 20, 20 years old, maybe. That, uh, one of the tellies on the wall here that you can't see is a 98, I think. So that's over 20 years. That's, I guess that's approaching vintage. <laughs> Some might say I'm approaching vintage. Uh, let's see. Uh, if I miss some, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm doing my best. How many guitars do I have? Uh, a lot. I'm not sure. Um, it's, it's, you know, my Sir's my number one. My wife bought it for me. That's, that's always going to, you know, that, my Sir Strat, it's right over there. You can't see it, but it's just right there. That's, that's number one. Probably always will be. Um, when, uh, it'll be, it's, it, it almost needs new frets. I've about worn them out and that's kind of sad for me, but I guess it's okay. You know, uh, anyway, that's, that's the main one. Um, let me see. I don't see any more. Qu you have often said you should only play the major pentatonic scale over the one chord. Is there a time you can play a major pentatonic over the four or five chords? Uh, you can, you can't over the four. And the, and the reason, quite simply, is because you're going to put a major 7th in where you should have a minor 7th. So if, if I was an A, and I, of course I can play a major pentatonic as well as a minor pentatonic. When I get to the D7, or D9, or whatever variant that you play, I need a C, not a C sharp. So I definitely cannot play the major blues scale or major blues sound over the four chord. Over the five chord, you actually, the A would be okay, the B is okay, the F sharp, the E, the C sharp, the B, they're all okay. So they're not, you're not gonna stumble upon anything that's wrong. I don't know if you'll love the sound, but you might not hate the sound. It's it would be a little bit unusual, um, and 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 really, you know, it's 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 always hard for me to say like this is good. Okay, whenever I whenever you hear me judge a sound as this is a good sound or this is probably not a good sound, my judge, sort of my litmus test for that is always based on what I see commonly done in the blues okay so i've transcribed thousands of bars of of solos from stevie ray vaughan and bb king and albert king and you name it um bonamassa walter trout eric clapton I, the list is is long and i've transcribed gobs and gobs and gobs of it over the years so what i the way i judge a good sound because obviously if you like it it's a good sound right i mean who am i to judge but i judge that by do i see this a lot in standard classic traditional blues that you know most people listen to so it's it that's sort of my litmus test i kind of you know i like to listen to stuff that's a little weird sometimes so you know like scott henderson for example who's kind of plays like this blues rock jazz fusion type of stuff he, yeah he might play that all day long but it would that's that's unusual so i hope i hope that makes sense i know it's it's always hard for me to uh to specifically say oh yeah that's a good sound or that's that's not a good sound or you can do this or you can't do that Obviously, you can do whatever you like, but at the end of the day, I'm judging it based on what is common and what you see out there in the world, you know, day after day after day. Okay. Uh, oh, the jam track at the start of this? Um, not sure. It's on my Ultimate Blues Jams. I forgot which one I used. Oh, From My Head Down to My Shoes. That's from, I think that's Ultimate Blues Jams Volume 2. Uh, so if you have it, it was from my head down to my shoes. It's basically, uh, buddy guys, damn right I got the blues. 
So that's what most of those Ultimate Blues Jams tracks are, you know, tunes that you probably would recognize in some way. Uh, right, let's see. Uh, looks like that's about out. Um, let me see what we got going on over here. Uh, did you end up with a Nace Pro 50? No, I did not. He said he'd build me one. Uh, cool though that would be. What's your favorite amp in the background? Um, well, of these, of these back here, uh, that one right there, that is, actually no, it's, it's none of these, it's in the other room. Um, I have a, I have an original NACE prototype that's actually my favorite, and it's a Class A, I don't know, it's just this one, it just sounds a little sweeter than all the rest, and uh, and Art offered several times to kind of tweak it and make it better, and I said, no, don't touch it. <laughs> so I wouldn't let him do anything to it. Um, my, I'll say my favorite amp that I, that I use mostly, you know, day in and day out, I have a uh, Two Rock Emerald Pro that's one of my favorites, and I have a Matchless Chieftain, and an Eggnator TOL 100. Those are kind of my three main amps. Um, I use the, the Plexi a lot for the rock stuff. If we do, um, uh, if I do the band with my wife, uh, Yard Sale, and, and we do, you know, rock stuff like some Van Halen and all that kind of stuff, Plexi does great for that. So that's, that's where that comes from. Uh, all right. It looks like, wow, I think I've answered everything. Was that vodka? Oh no, sorry, uh, it's Gentleman Jack. Uh, I'm a, I'm a bourbon, I'm a bourbon guy. Um, cool, I think I've answered everything. Look at that, 40, 48 minutes later. Thanks for hanging out with me, guys. This was super, super fun. I hope you all had as good a time as I did. And, uh, oh, do you have any upcoming courses you can give a sneak peek of? Uh, no. I don't, I don't like to give sneak peeks, but I do have, I do have some stuff in the works. So, um, there's definitely stuff. Oh, let's see what we got here. Do you know how to take a major lick or riff and make it Phrygian, Lydian, or minor? Uh, that doesn't really make sense. Uh, in the sense that, like, let's say you had a major lick, but it had no four in it. The only difference between major and Lydian is the four. So if you had no four in it, you wouldn't have anything to do. If it did have a four, sharp it, because that's the characteristic note of, of the Lydian scale. So what you want to look for with any mode, whenever you're dealing with a mode, if you're trying to migrate a lick from one mode to another mode, you want to look at the characteristic note and change the characteristic note. So in Dorian, it's you know flat three, flat seven, but the six is natural. Phrygian is the flat two, flat two, three, six, and seven, right? Lydian sharp four, Mixolydian flat seven, Aeolian flat three, six, and seven, Locrian flat three, f drawing a blank, two, three, five, six, and seven, right? Four is the only one that's not. And I sometimes, I, <laughs> Lydian and Lydian dominant, no, Lydian and altered dominant are, altered dominant has, has a flat two. So, Locrian does not. Sorry, not Lydian. Locrian is what I mean to say. I think my brain is going to oatmeal. <laughs> um, okay, I'm gonna call it a day there. I think I've I think I've answered all the questions. So uh, y'all take care of yourselves, and uh, I will probably see you on Monday. I don't. Uh, for those of you that were asking, I don't. I'll say plan the time when I do these live things. I, I I've been doing them just about every weekday. Uh, I haven't missed one in a while. I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep that up, so I hesitate to say, yes, I'm going to do this. I'll see you Monday at whatever time. Um, I, I don't know if I will. So um, I just kind of have been doing it when the, when the opportunity presents itself. So uh, if you, uh, you know, if you're a Facebook user and you like the Blues Guitar Unleashed page, I believe there's a way you can, in fact, if you're on right now, I believe you can click, a, there's a little something, the little three dots or whatever that you can say, I want to be notified every time, you know, Blues Guitar Unleashed goes live. I believe you can do that in Facebook. Uh, if you're on the YouTube and you, um, uh, if you 
subscribe to the channel, then when I go live, I believe you'll get some sort of notification. Again, I'm, I'm learning about all this stuff. I've learned how to do the streaming, but I don't use YouTube very often. I don't use Facebook very often. So I'm, I'm still learning how to, how to help you, uh, you know, do that kind of stuff. But, uh, but the, uh, the long and short of it is definitely subscribe or like, follow, whatever it is that you do, or again, you know, jump on the email list. And I, whenever, you know, if I'm, if I'm going to do this stuff, I can send it out to you uh, via email. Um, I also often post the replays up on my blog so I can email you that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of ways I can, I can get in touch with you much better and uh, we can, we can do a lot more via email. So if you're so inclined, uh, please do that. The links were at the beginning and I guess that's it for me today. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for hanging out. I had uh, a lot of fun. So I will say cheers and Friday is here. Take care.